Have you ever looked up at the night sky and wondered if we are alone in the universe? Well, a group of scientists in Mountain View are asking that same question. Our guest today on The Better Part is Dr. Seth Shosek, who is Senior Astronomer for the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Join us and find out about listening for extraterrestrials. Dr. Seth Shostak earned a bachelor's degree in physics at Princeton University and a PhD in astrophysics at the California Institute of Technology. He has published more than 60 papers in refereed professional journals, as well as more than 500 articles in newspapers and magazines. Dr. Shostak, welcome to The Better Part. Thanks very much, Chuck. So can you tell us, how did you first become interested in astronomy as a profession? Well, I gotta say, it's not a terribly dramatic <laughs> response that I can offer you. But I was eight years old, I was looking at some books, an atlas actually, that my parents had. I was very interested in maps as a kid. I see. And in the back, of the back of the book, there was this funny diagram with these concentric circles. And I asked my mom, what, what's that? And she said, those are planets. I'd never heard the word, huh. but I became interested at that point in astronomy. I would go to the local library, get some books there. And uh, by age 10, I'd build a telescope. I was trying to make pictures of the moon and, and time-lapse movies at of age the moon. 10, you built a telescope? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but it was not such a big deal. Right. I think <laughs> a lot of kids do that. Sort uh -huh. of thing. Yeah. Were you studying astronomy at all in school at that time? No, or? I mean, obviously at that age, I mean, what, what are you, you, you in the, like the fourth grade or something okay. like that. But uh, they would have a science component. Right. I mean, there, was, there wasn't a separate science teacher. You had one teacher all day long. Oh, but okay. But they would teach you yeah. some science. And, uh, you know, astronomy was kind of interesting because it dealt with big things. Yeah, I don't think we got into astronomy at all until I was about seventh grade or so. Oh, really? So, so. Um, can you, so it was just kind of magazines and uh, pictures uh, laying around the house that prompted your uh, curiosity and so on. You asked more questions about these. Yeah, and it was also the time when, uh, you know, it was the, the after the war and Werner von Braun was working for the Americans and he was talking about how he was, you know, aiming for the stars. Oh, yeah. You know, after aiming for London, London for a long time, <laughs> but he was going to aim for the stars. And uh, there was a series of mar uh, magazine articles, very wonderfully illustrated showing rockets you know that would go into space and take people to the moon or maybe beyond i mean he said he was aiming for the stars but you know initially you aim for the moon it's a lot, <laughs> lot closer so of course that that was a real incentive uh, and you to, probably had things on tv too that you were watching did you or? oh yeah yeah no there were there were television shows uh, set in space right. and at the movies uh, not only did they have space films, but they had a lot of cheesy sci-fi films. I remember those, yes. <laughs> involving extraterrestrials who would come to Earth, you know, merely to incinerate the planet because they were ticked off about something. I'm not quite sure. So uh, can you tell us what is SETI and how and why was it started? Well, SETI, the idea that there might be life beyond Earth, that, that's an old idea. And right. I, I'm sure that goes back to, you know, before recorded history. I can hardly believe that the, the, the Homo sapiens 100,000 years ago, they go out at night, well, they're already out, right? And they look at the, the sky and they see all these, you know, these stars and so forth. Right. They don't know what they are. They don't know how far away they are. They, they really know nothing, but they just presume that these are other worlds. Certainly the Greeks did. Really? That these are other, oh, yeah. No, they, they talked about how all these things were populated uh, with, with gods or, or, or humans or human-like creatures. So the idea is very old, but you really couldn't do anything about it until the, the Victorian era. There were some proposed experiments to signal our buddies on Mars. Uh -huh. well, we don't have any buddies on Mars, but still. <laughs> but in 1960, an astronomer by the name of Frank Drake, who, uh, you know, he's still actually quite active in this. So that's what, uh, 60 years ago, he used an antenna that existed in West Virginia mm -hmm. for astronomy, and he... Uh, he pointed at a couple of nearby stars, hoping to eavesdrop on radio signals that would, you know, tell us that, well, there's somebody up there that's clever enough to build a transmitter. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that the ancient Greeks actually looked up at the stars and thought about being populated. 
They did. They did. I, know, I mean, they, they gave, uh -huh. of course, they gave the planets names, right. and, uh, you know, and it was all based in mythology, but, but they, had a, they had a cosmology, the Greeks did. They're very clever. In, in addition to inventing geometry, well, inventing science, right. uh, they also, you know, they, they thought, okay, we don't know what these things are. They could only see them as little bright dots, but they figured that they housed beings. So it's an old idea. So uh, we talk about the SETI Insti or the Institute. Uh, how was SETI funded today? Uh, well, the SETI Institute, when I joined the SETI Institute, which, by the way, was founded in 1984, but when I joined it around 1991, somewhere around there, I don't quite remember. <laughs> I think they used a neuralizer <laughs> on me. But when I joined it, it was still a NASA project. I see. So NASA was spending a rather small amount of money for, for NASA, but it was a large amount of money for this particular project, you know, a few million dollars a year, up to $10 million a year, to build equipment, modernize the whole concept that would, you know, specialized receivers uh, that would be optimized for looking for signals coming from mm -hmm. deep space, and also to use these uh, receivers on big existing antennas, right, to try and, try and uh, push this idea and actually do a search. Now, unfortunately, very shortly after the search began, within a year, actually, a congressman from Nevada introduced a Senate amendment and just killed the whole project. So since then, SETI has been funded in this country, in any case, um, entirely by donations, private donations. So you have uh, some very large donors in the, throughout the country, you must. You well, we, we have had in the past. At the moment, we don't have too many of those, but indeed, you have. It's, it's like, I think, funding the opera, right? There's a big body of rather, uh -huh. you know, a modest uh, donors, uh, I, I don't mean that they're personally <laughs> modest, although they might be, but you know that they're giving you modest amounts of money, and then there are always a few donors who give you uh, uh, rather larger mm -hmm. amounts of money. But it's, it's very constrained. The search is very limited, not because we don't know what to do, not because there aren't lots of planets out there, but because there's no money. So how can one donate to SETI if they wanted to? Very easy. They just go to our website, SETI.org. Okay. That's all you have to do, and you'll, you'll find all sorts of info on this. So what, what methods are you using to try to detect communications from intelligent life forms? Yeah, you might think, okay, so we just point some antennas at a nearby star system, right? I mean, you know, obviously the aliens are probably not living on stars. <laughs> That's a little toasty. Yeah. <laughs> but what we know now, which, by the way, we didn't know even 10 years ago, is that most stars have planets. When I was a kid, it wasn't clear whether the planets were very commonplace, you know, like fire hydrants or something, mm -hmm. or whether they were very, very rare, you know, they were very sparsely distributed throughout the cosmos, because we didn't know how planets were made. We still are not so sure how planets are made, but we didn't know whether there were a lot of them or not. Well, it turns out there are a lot of them, right? They're, <laughs> they're like flies or mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, almost every star has planets. So that's good news in a sense. It means in our Milky Way galaxy, there are like a trillion with a T. A trillion? Trillion. Planets, trillion. That's a lot of planets. And most of them are not very interesting. I mean, you know, from the standpoint of life, if they're like Jupiter or Neptune or something like that. But some of them are going to be okay. So, you know, that, that, uh, that encourages us uh, to look. And uh, while we haven't found anything yet, I bet everybody a cup of coffee that we'll find something in the next two dozen years. So you've got this immense space to cover. How many listening stations do you have? One. One listening station. Yeah, well, it's, that, that's a money thing. We, yes. have, we have some antennas. They're called radio telescopes, by the way. People think of astronomy involving telescopes. But these big antennas are telescopes, too. They don't look like the ones people are familiar with, with mirrors or lenses. But they do exactly the same thing, just with radio instead of light. And uh, it, it's located up in the Cascade Mountains if you drive up to Redding, California, and you make a turn to the east and go for an hour and a half into the Cascades, that's where it is. That's interesting. I guess I was under the impression for some reason that you had uh, stations spread throughout the world. That would be wonderful. Yeah, that, that would mean you wouldn't miss something uh -huh. just because, you know, the, the signals are coming in from <laughs> on the other side of the earth, if you will, when you, when, and you're not listening there. No, it would be good to have listening stations around the world. We don't, and that's strictly a, a, a financial thing. Uh, just curious, uh, was uh, this uh, site open for business essentially during the wildfires up in that area or did that interfere with the tremendous Well, the place? recent wildfires yes. actually were quite far away from where this installation okay. is. But in the past, uh, some wildfires have gotten to within a mile of the antennas. Mm -hmm. And that was of some concern because you know they were coming toward it and it, 
they were stopped. Actually, there was a, a road there that yeah. acted as a fire break. So we we didn't uh, lose any any you know equipment there. Uh, I have to say that the one restaurant in town, uh, which <laughs> served burgers and shakes, it was burned down, unfortunately. Oh, gee. Yeah. Did the ash and soot in the air interfere with operations? Or? No. no. The, this is, these are radio waves, okay. uh, what are called microwaves. So okay. the wavelength of these waves is like this. It's the same frequencies uh -huh. that, for example, your cell phone uses, okay? Uh, and they go right through. I mean, it doesn't matter what's in the atmosphere. I mean, mm -hmm. rain, dust, crud of any sort, radio waves go right through all that. So uh, we're listening for signals from extraterrestrials. Are we also sending signals here from Earth into outer space, hoping that somebody else hears us? Well, there are people who want to do that. They want to make deliberate broadcasts saying, hey, we're the Earthlings. Uh, it's a very controversial subject. You would say, what's controversial about it? And what's controversial, of course, is that, well, you don't really know what's out there. Well, that's true. Right. And, and maybe your signal is picked up by a hostile society, and they decide, well, all right, there's somebody over there, and they might be, uh, I don't know, competitors in the export market. I mean, I don't know what they think. <laughs> And, and then they send their interstellar battle wagons and they destroy the earth and, you know, you feel bad about it. I mean, there are people who seriously worry about that. Really? I'm not, I'm not one of them, obviously, but, but there are people. But we are broadcast, and so we don't broadcast. We don't even have transmitters. There are some people who do want to and who are doing uh, that sort of thing. Uh, in San Francisco, there's an organization called METI International, Messaging Extraterrestrial okay. Intelligence, and they, they, they've already done a couple of test broadcasts. Uh, we don't we don't have the equipment to do that. We don't have the money to do that. But then there are some people interested in it. But I can tell you this: uh, we're broadcasting willy nilly. You know, forget all these these initiatives. The airport radars are broadcasting into space every day, all day. Mm -hmm. And if you're a society that's more advanced than us, which would be the only society you'd have to worry about, right? Uh, they they probably have antennas big enough to pick up all this leakage coming off the Earth. So. Uh, when you're listening and picking up all these signals coming in, how, what criteria do you use to differentiate between a signal possibly sent from an intelligent life form versus just random random noise? Yeah, well, most of the noise is not so random. We pick up signals all the time. This is a little different than in the movies. When you see SETI portrayed in the movies, and you know, there's always some guy with earphones on, you know, that's wrong yeah, right so there. Yeah, listen to this, listen yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're usually looking bored because they come in every day listening to these things, never hear anything. But then in the movie, suddenly they get a signal and say, my God, that's it, right? And everybody goes, you know, nuts and they, you know, start calling up the, mm. the media or whatever. Right. In fact, we don't know where on the dial a signal might be. So instead of listening to two channels at once, if you will, which you could do with a pair of earphones maybe, uh, we listen to, these days, like 70 million channels simultaneously. That's, you know, that's a lot of earphones, so we don't do it with earphones. But uh, the, the, the signature that we're looking for is that the signal is at one spot on the radio dial. And while you probably don't think about this very much, that's how you find signals uh, with your you know, car radio, for example. In the old days, it was actually a knob. Mm -hmm. And you're turning it, and you hear you know, just static, right. and lightning and stuff. And then suddenly, like, here, right? And then, oh, there's your country and western station, which I know is what you like, Chuck. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's what you're starting to listen to. But it's at one spot on the dial. It's, you know, uh, 780 kilohertz on the dial or whatever it is. It's not all over the dial. Okay. Nature makes radio static that's all over the dial. That's how we can tell. Interesting. Then, then when we, if we were to send out a signal, we would do the same thing. Then we would try to keep it on one spot on the dial. More yeah. Or less. Yeah. And um, by the way, that also saves you a lot of energy. Right? <laughs> you don't have to fill the dial with noise, right? You just put all the energy on a s very small band. Yeah, that's that's. You know, that's okay. just communication theory. That's been understood since the Second World War. So have we received some signals that people thought were uh, sent by intelligent life forms? We have done. Uh, I mean, we get signals all the time. As I say, roughly every 10 seconds you get a signal. Something really? Like that. That, that, that often? Okay. Yeah, but they're all due to, um, they're not all, but most of them are due to telecommunications, satellites, other kinds of satellites that we put in orbit around the Earth. I mean, there are thousands of these things, right? Right, right. And they're sending information back on, you know, the weather or, I don't know, military movements, whatever they're sending back, okay? Uh, you know, the imagery you see on Google Earth, uh, that's some satellite made that, and they send that data back to Earth, and that means they have transmitters. So these transmitters are going over all the time. We have to sort that out. My God, that's tremendously background. Yeah, they're, 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 that's right. That's why there's signals all the yeah. time. And, you know, 
So that, that's a problem. That's actually maybe the hardest problem in this whole endeavor, uh -huh. aside from the funding. Uh, and, and what you would like to do, I suppose, if, if you really had unlimited money, is you would just move the whole experiment to the backside of the moon, which, is, you know, if you think about it, that's the one spot in the universe, I guess, the one spot in the universe that's totally shielded from all this interference here on Earth and all the satellites around us because you got the moon in the way, right? But obviously we're not doing that. So how many people does SETI have uh, as far as uh, actual scientists who listen for signals and try to sort out background noise from possible meaningful signals? It's very small. When it was a NASA program, there were on the order of 50 people involved. Okay. At the SETI Institute now, it's a handful. It's very small. Uh, the University of California at Berkeley got a, a, a fairly large grant of money from a, uh, an entrepreneur here actually in the valley, a Russian uh, a billionaire actually, and mm -hmm. he gave them money. So they do have money. They have a lot more than we do. So they're, they're like a dozen people working there. The rest of the world, nobody, not at the nobody. moment. Nobody. Nobody. It's crazy. This has been an American experiment for quite a while now, a number of years, an exclusively American experiment. And uh, I find that that's a little distressing. Uh -huh. and, and also, I think it says something about the culture in the U.S. because we're willing to uh, take a long shot. We're willing to take a chance on something that, you know, it's unclear what the chances for success might be. But if you do succeed, it would be very important. I've lived in Europe, and uh, they, have, they do wonderful science. They could do any of this sort of stuff, and they don't. And I think it's a cultural thing. Now, earlier in our discussion, you mentioned to Professor Drake. And I was reading on this subject recently, and they talk about, a lot about the Drake equation. Right. Can you tell us uh, what is the Drake equation, and what, what does it mean? Yeah. Well, there's nothing more exciting on television than to hear somebody talk about an equation. So <laughs> I'll do it, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned earlier, in 1960, there was this first experiment by, by Frank Drake, actually, in which he used an antenna in, in, in West Virginia and tried to right. eavesdrop on signals that might be coming from a couple of nearby stars. But that generated so much popular interest. I mean, there, was, there were articles in magazines and the newspaper about this that uh, he was encouraged to organize a professional conference about this whole idea of proving that we have cosmic company by eavesdropping. And so that conference was held in 1961, uh, again in West Virginia, and he, you know, there were like 13 people in attendance. It was a very small conference. But he needed an agenda. Okay. And he came up with this little formula, which has been subsequently named the Drake Equation, uh, as an agenda. And all it was trying to do was say, okay, look, does this make sense? It only makes sense if we can expect a large number of aliens to be out there. Okay. okay? And so the equation tries to estimate that on the basis of, uh, well, how many stars are out there that might have planets with... How many planets are there? How many of those planets are good planets, you know, with oceans and atmospheres? How many of those planets have cooked up life? How many of those have cooked up intelligent life? There's mm -hmm. been life on Earth for three or three right. and a half or four billion years. Most of it wasn't terribly clever. And then, um, you know, what fraction of them are on the air now? That kind of thing. And that's the Drake equation. So, uh, yeah, because you made a very good point there about the, uh, be the difference between life and intelligence, intelligent life. Of course, intelligent life would be much more interested than, I say, bacteria, I assume. Yeah, bacteria don't build radio transmitters, <laughs> right. as far as I know. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, if, if they do, they're pretty small. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And that's a very controversial thing, actually, right. because, you know, uh, as I say, Earth has had life for, you know, close to 4 billion uh -huh. years, okay? And for 80% of that time, there was nothing big enough to see without a microscope. Right, 80% no of that, yeah. Yeah, it was just all microbes, right? Uh, and then you got multicellular uh -huh. things, you get trilobites, you get dinosaurs, you get all that stuff. But it's not clear that nature's ever going to cook up something that's clever enough to build a radio right. transmitter. And you could say, oh, come on. Of course it will. You just wait long enough and it'll happen. Maybe, maybe. But, you know, think about it. 66 million mm -hmm. years ago, you know, the dinos and two-thirds of everything else were wiped out by a rock, right? Uh, and, and if that rock had arrived, you know, an hour earlier, it would have missed the Earth. And we wouldn't be having this conversation. There would be dinosaurs in Mountain View, yeah. <laughs> and dinosaurs were really bad at electrical engineering. So, uh, you know, I, 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 it's, it's just very unclear. Yeah. Just because you have life, you know, evolution is not terribly interested in producing intelligence. It just is interested in survival. And uh, the microbes do pretty good on that score. One of the terms that we hear about on the news media right now, we talk about Goldilocks planets. What are Goldilocks planets? Where are they, and how, how many are there? Goldilocks... Planets, yes. Well, this is a term for planets. 
I mean, you can, you can imagine, okay, here's a star, and here's a planet and a bunch of other planets, maybe there are eight or nine planets around that star. And some of them are like Mercury around the sun. It's so close to the sun, it's just too hot for anything, right? right? It's also small, which is a bad thing. And then there are planets that are farther out, you know, they're just too cold. And when you say hot and cold, you usually uh, assign that on the basis of the effects on water. I mean, if, if it's so hot that water would be always boiling, right. you're not going to get much life there. And if, if the water is always solid ice, you're not going to get much life there either. But there's sort of a Goldilocks zone, just <laughs> like the, the porridge in Goldilocks, where it's not too hot and it's not too cold, <laughs> right? Like the Earth, right, where you can have water that's liquid, right? and, and uh, you know, so Earth is obviously in the Goldilocks zone for the sun. So for every star, you can calculate, well, where's the Goldilocks zone? And the question is, are there any planets there? So fortuitously located. <laughs> and it, it seems that the, uh, there are many planets in the Goldilocks zones of other stars. That's not so uncommon. Now, in the movies, uh, for instance, uh, the, the movie Independence Day, which a lot of people have seen, uh, they, you know, the movie starts out with people listening for signals from outer space. And, say, and somebody says, hear this, hurry, hear this, and they call the Air Force, and the Air Force calls the president, and one thing leads to another. Uh, in your opinion, what would happen if we actually received a signal that we truly believed was sent by an intelligent life form? If we had a reasonably high confidence that it was, would this communication, would this information be sent to a wide audience, or what, what would happen? What would be yeah. the results of this? I, you know, if you were to grab the next 10 people off the street here, <laughs> not that I commend you, uh -huh. <laughs> not that I recommend you do that, but if you were to do that and say, hey, yeah, suppose they actually found proof that aliens exist, what do you think right. would happen? The usual reaction is, well, the government would cover it up, and they would right. never hear about it, right? And if you ask why would that be, they'll, they'll tell you because the, the, the public couldn't handle the news. Yeah. All right, let me just consider you a member of the public. I mean, you know, if you read in the papers, if there were any papers when this happened, you know, that the, the scientists had found a signal, would you say, well, that's it? You know, I can't handle that news. I'm just going to, you know, get in bed and never get out again, or I'm going to ride in the streets or what? No, you wouldn't. You would say, hey, that's interesting. Maybe tell me more. So while it is generally believed that this information would not be shared, we've had a couple of false alarms. And what you see is the first thing that happens is the newspapers and the, the radio and TV stations c start mm -hmm. calling up. There's no policy of secrecy. So, uh, you know, the story will be out there right away. And, of course, it would be a big event, and right. you'd have uh, lots of people looking for more signals. So uh, the next thing I was going to ask you, I guess you've already answered, is that are, are there organizations, I was going to ask you if there are organizations similar to SETI in other countries or other listening sites that were doing things similar to SETI, but it sounds like there aren't. This is strictly an American thing. These days it's strictly American. In the days of the Soviet Union, the Soviets were very involved. In fact, many of the, the really clever ideas for uh, you know this, this problem, trying to find out if there's life beyond Earth, it came out of the Soviet Union, but when the Soviet Union collapsed, 1991, I think, uh, that you know they lost all their funding, yeah. so they haven't done very much since. And uh, Europeans don't do too much. The Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans have all expressed interest, but at the moment, uh, the SETI experiments that are going on in the world are all conducted by Americans. But uh, okay, there. Uh, do you have uh, scientists though from other countries participating, or? Well, you know, the, the, not at the SETI okay. Institute, at the University of California, okay. Berkeley, in their program, you know, they have grad students, and right. I, I honestly don't know from which countries they come. Right. I, I would be surprised to find out that there aren't some from some other country. So given the distances involved that radio waves have to travel, uh, you know, we're talking about light years here, right? Yes. Uh, what do you personally think is the likelihood that we'll be hearing from an extraterrestrial intelligent life form in our lifetime. Well, I, I think it's pretty good. Now, that might be, you know, whistling in the dark. Maybe I'm just trying to, you know, make myself feel uh -huh. better by saying it's going to happen while I'm still, you know, kicking. Uh, but this whole experiment is very dependent on computers. And uh, here in the Silicon Valley, we know that there's something called Moore's Law. Every 18 months, every two years, whatever, the speed of the computer you can buy at your local computer store doubles. And that's just the improvement in technology. And it's also an economic thing for the people who are selling you <laughs> computers. They want you to buy a new computer. But that affects us because it means we can double the speed of the search right. on average every couple of years. Right. And on that basis, you can, you can, you know, simple calculation, you can figure that by 
2025, 20, well, make that 2030 or 2035, we'll have looked at maybe a million star systems. Okay. I think that might a be million. the right number, a yeah. million. And I think in my, in, my, in my heart that that might be, but maybe my stomach, maybe I should say, <laughs> it's my gut. I, I believe my gut. I think that my gut tells me that if you look at a million star systems, you have a, some decent chance that you might find something. So that's why I bet everybody a cup of coffee that we will succeed within that time frame. Are there any closing remarks you'd like to make about the SETI or uh, extraterrestrial life? Well, only this. I mean, you know, people, people have things to do every day. They've got to get on with their lives, their careers, their, you know, their relationships and all. And they often don't think about such things as what's beyond the Earth. But the Earth is a very, very tiny mote of dust right. in a very, very big arena. And uh, occasionally it might be worthwhile to consider the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're just bit players in a very, very large canvas, and there might be other players out there. Well, thank you very much for coming today, and I certainly enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Also, I would like to invite our TV viewers to join us and become members of The Better Part. Visitors are always welcome to attend our meetings held at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays at the Cupertino Senior Center. If you are interested in becoming a Better Part member, please contact the Senior Center for more information or simply attend one of our meetings. Remember, too, that our shows are also available for viewing on Roku and YouTube. Thanks for watching.